Hey guys, what's up? So defense has always been very important for personal protection, but with evolving breakthroughs in technology, defense is a field that constantly needs refreshing innovation. Without innovation like bulletproof vests, John Wick would definitely not have had his two sequels. And so in this video, we're gonna be talking about the science behind why John Wick got his two sequels and why plastic was the main reason for it. So in this video, we're gonna be talking about the history to get some context of body armor. The building blocks, where we talk about the essentials for body armor. The deep dive, where we take a look at what plastics really are. And the design, where we can finally see how plastics are incorporated to design bulletproof vests. And at the end of the video, we're gonna take a little glimpse into the future to see what kind of breakthroughs are just around the corner in bulletproof technology. It's history time. So in early human civilizations, tribes just used animal hide, which is leather, and so you use that kind of armor in the preliminary Minecraft stages. And then in ancient Roman days, armor was made from metal plates. The Middle Ages then took this concept further by coating the entire body in either chainmail or metal plating. Guys, think of the classic knight armor suits, that's what I'm talking about. But there was definitely some negatives to this. So the chainmail was about 30 pounds, which is pretty heavy. And then the whole armor body suit was like 60 pounds. And so just remember though, that in any body armor, there's an unbroken direct relationship between weight and safety. Chainmail, for example, was way lighter compared to a knight's body armor, but small swords and sharp arrows could pierce right through it. So what do you do when you want an impenetrable metal armor back in the middle ages? you just make it thicker, and that makes it heavier. And the knight's armor was a beast for its time. The shape of the armor deflected most arrows that shot at it. Its inertial mass was enough to eat most hits and brush it off like it was nothing. And it was thick enough that swords and arrows had a hard time piercing through it, even if they hit the right spot. And if somebody did succeed in penetrating that armor, they usually used a hulking weapon like a mace. But near the end of the medieval ages, firearms and cannons began to dominate, and people began looking for a solution, the bulletproof armor. But we didn't have much luck with creating that. There's a reason why the Civil War was the bloodiest war that America has ever been in. It's very important to remember one thing, right? So the problem in history isn't blocking projectiles, because we can always block projectiles by just putting a thicker metal sheet in front of us. The problem has been making an armor that can block projectiles while still allowing the individual to move around in it comfortably. It wasn't until the 60s when we finally figured out how to block bullets with wearable armor. Until then, and even now under high risk situations, we usually use thick metal plates or ceramic tiles made out of alumina. And alumina is just like sapphire. That's what it's made out of. So now let's talk about soft body armor because that's where we can use plastic. So soft body armor is body armor that's comfortable for an individual to wear. And that's where plastics come in. Body armor has to protect us. And when something is shot at us, we need to identify the elements that we need to avoid or mitigate in that process. The incoming projectile has a lot of energy that needs to be drained before it punctures that armor and enters the body. Therefore, the protecting material needs to be able to spread this energy throughout itself. Otherwise, a concentrated energy, even if it does not puncture the armor, will cause blunt force trauma. Well, for starters, we want soft material to make it comfortable for the individual to wear. So that's check mark number one. The second thing that we need to answer is how do we make sure that these fibers capture the high energy projectile going its way? Well, what if we had a lot of them, right? So if we have a lot of fibers right next to each other to form a net, then the projectile will get caught the same way that the net catches a soccer ball. But then how do we make sure that these fibers absorb that much energy if we can't glue them right next to each other, right? These fibers are really small and there's not like a scotch glue that we can use to plaster them together. Well, how about we take that net analogy one step further and we interlace the fibers together like a soccer net. That way, the fibers are in a secure position and they are able to deform together when a projectile makes contact. And this caused the force to transfer uniformly. And that's actually what bulletproof fabric is. Just long strands of fiber interlaced to form a dense net, kind of like a soccer net. And that's how Kevlar works. And Kevlar is five times stronger than steel with the same weight. And Kevlar is plastic. So with all that being said, we want plastic in body armor because certain plastics 
are long enough to make nice fibers that can be interwoven and the bonding tendencies that allow for a nice strong hold. That is why we use some plastics. So just like Kevlar, any plastic that has these two properties can be very, very strong without weighing a whole lot, which is exactly what we want for armor that people have to wear. So now let's talk about the foundation. Let's briefly talk about how plastics are made. The raw material formation begins by separating the hydrocarbon chemicals from just natural gas, petroleum, or coal into pure streams of chemicals. Some are then processed into a cracking process. And here, in the presence of a catalyst, the raw material molecules are converted into monomers, which are just basic chains of hydrocarbons, such as ethylene, propylene, and butene, and a few others. And then they start this huge process where they take these small chains and then link them together, possibly like thousands of times, into one single chain, and that's called polymerization. And the exact length of the chain will actually give the material different properties, which is why plastic can be so versatile and sometimes soft and pliable, and other times very, very rigid. And now let's talk about the design. So the versatility of plastics, like what we mentioned earlier, how different chain lengths can create different type of plastic properties, is exactly what we're looking for when we're making body armor and when we're making a net. Because with a net, we're able to transfer energy by involving all the strands in an impact. And to have that happen, we need specific plastic properties. But another thing that we need to worry about is how far the net stretches while it tries to slow down the bullet. The bulletproof net can't deform too much because if it does, like a piece of cloth when you push on it, then it will puncture the body. So we need to make sure that the strands are thicker. But how can we do that? How can we make the thin strands thicker? Well, what if we just twist the strands together? That way we can make thicker strands that have increased density and thickness. And then if we want to make it just a little bit more thicker, how about we sandwich those thick strands of plastic between two thin films of plastic? Kind of like a sandwich. And so this would lessen the impact that the person feels by making the vest thicker, but flexible enough to where a person can wear it comfortably. Congratulations, we just engineered a bulletproof vest. But remember that this sort of method isn't good for all conditions, right? So the National Institute for Justice grades bulletproofness from levels one through four. And type three is where they begin using rigid plates because that's where they deal with larger calibers of bullets. So now that we know how bulletproof armor uses plastic fibers to block bullets, let's take a look at Kevlar and let's dive in a little deeper into what Kevlar actually is. So Kevlar is called a synthetic aromatic polyamide. And that just means that it's made in the laboratory, unlike natural textiles such as cotton, which grows on plants, and wool, which comes from animals. It's aromatic, which means that the Kevlar molecules have a strong ring like structure like that of a benzene. It's a polyamide, which means that the ring-like aromatic molecules that we talked about earlier connect together to form long chains. And this makes sense, because remember we talked about how longer chains of a plastic give different properties. And so we want a longer chain in this case. And polymer just means that it's made out of a lot of small chains of molecules called monomers. All right, so let's just say we made Kevlar in the lab. Does that mean that we're done and that we basically have a bulletproof vest in a test tube? Not necessarily. So we get Kevlar from a series of chemical reactions. That much we know so far. But what we haven't covered is how Kevlar's chemical structure naturally makes it form in tiny, straight little rods that pack closely together, kind of like stiff new pencils stuffed in tightly into a box. But if we keep adding a lot of pencils in there, what's gonna happen is that these pencils are naturally gonna start falling and then they're gonna get disorganized, kind of like if you shake a box full of pencils. And so what happens with Kevlar is the exact same thing. Individually, they form uh, straight rods, but if you add a lot of them together, they get disorganized, kind of like uh, straight pretzels in a container. So what we have to do then is we have to take that raw plastic and then turn it into a fiber by wet spinning it. That means that we heat up that plastic and pour it through a spinneret, which is like a sieve. The chains that naturally line up together because of something we call pneumatic behavior. And so we finally, through this process, get the fibers to strain up and then interact with each other in the way that we want. And this gives us stronger fibers. Now let's take a look at this chart right here. As we can see, the more layers you have, the faster you need to fire a bullet to get it to penetrate through the Kevlar armor. 
In other words, if you want to protect soldiers against high velocity rifle bullets, you're going to need much thicker armor than if you simply want to protect police officers against handgun bullets. And this is because handgun bullets naturally have a low velocity and therefore kinetic energy. And the principles that we talked about earlier also apply to things like bulletproof glass. Now bulletproof glass is made out of putting pieces of plastic, a polycarbonate, in between panes of glass. Now the glass gives a structural support, but it's brittle. It doesn't do very well in absorbing energy. And so the plastic is used between layers to absorb most of the energy that is coming from a bullet. We may not have vibranium to sue, to sue, sue? Sue, so. Dumbass! We may not have vibranium to sew into our clothing, but we did come a very long way from the very first age of leather armor. You see, with further research into plastics and material sciences, we could develop an armor that could deflect bullets or even obliterate them through contact. Researchers at North Carolina State University actually developed a metal foam that absorbs energy better than sheet metal due to its porous properties. Since bullets are unable to penetrate the material, they literally just bounce off. Not only that, but the force that the material applies to the bullets is enough to completely shatter them. Now, transparent armor and self-healing armor aren't that far off as well. Who knows? Maybe we'll even see a real-life Colossus in the future. Guys, thank you for watching, and I'll see you soon. Ciao.